how those things are to be done in the house of God. And he said, uh, verse 27, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and that by course, and let one interpret. It is not, it is not allowed in the scripture for everyone to be speaking in tongues all at once, all over the building. It is not allowed. And if anybody who says, boy, the Holy Ghost really coming down on this place today, they are lying through their teeth because the Holy Ghost does not violate the scriptures. Does not do it. Scriptures cannot be broken. And if you think that God himself is higher than his word. I'll give you a verse out of the book of Psalms that says, Thou hast exalted thy word even above thy name. So God's name is of lesser value than his word is. That's how God sees it. God says, if it's going to be done by me, I'm going to do it. What did Jesus say in Hebrews before he left heaven to come to earth? Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Not even Jesus was going to go against what was written in the book. Not even Jesus would. So if you find yourself in a church or a revival or any kind of uh, evangelistic service or anything like that, and all of a sudden tongues break out from everywhere all at once, that is not the move of the Holy Spirit. Cannot be. Because he said, let it be by two at the most. Did a bird hit that? We hit a bird the other day. I mean, it smacked hard. Uh, he was headed in this building, I reckon. That'd be worse than the wasp. Um, let it be by two or at the most three. And, and that by course, meaning one, then another, then another. And no more. Than three. No more than three. And then after that, an interpretation is to be given. A translation is to be given of what they all said. Not two or three translations. Not five translations. One translation. So it's to be done in order. Okay? And in this same chapter, he says in verse 33... For God is not the author of confusion. God is not the author of confusion. Um, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So if it's good enough for one church, it applies to every church. God is not the author of confusion. And I've heard people describe their church services as pandemonium. A train wreck. That's not God's house. That's not God's order. And then he said, let your women keep silence in the churches. Meaning in the service, in the house of God. For it is not unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. So God did not. Jesus was telling the church here at Thyatira, number one, she's violating the scripture in that she is not permitted to teach nor usurp authority over men. When the service begins, she is to remain silent. So, Joyce Myers, is she sent of God or is she breaking scripture? She's breaking scripture, okay? Somebody said that they was at a hospital and they saw her and they said, how much Botox can one woman have? Okay? And um, I've known people who have worked for her at her office. She is, does not treat people well. When, it, when she's not on camera, in other words, she's not all smiles and positive and nice. 
She's not that. She is a holy terror to work for. But she's violating scripture in that she is usurping the authority of what should belong to the men in the church. Okay? Uh, Beth Moore, who is not charismatic, she's Southern Baptist. And that's where she got her start was in Southern Baptist churches. She, she speaks still in a lot of Southern Baptist churches. She has written many books. She has a lot of things out published and marketed. She makes pretty good living, I bet you. But she is allowed to go into churches, stand up on the stage behind the pulpit and teach and usurp authority over the men in that church. And that is not permitted. Um, turn to Colossians, I think is what it is. Ephesians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I'll find it in a minute. The qualifications for a bishop. Uh, it's in Timothy as well. Ephesians. Why can't I find Colossians? Uh, let's see here. Where are they? Qualifications for a yeah uh, for a bishop. Uh, I should have these in my notes, and I just didn't think to put it in there. But in both Colossians and in Timothy, Paul says the exact same thing um, about the office of a bishop. Or maybe I'm thinking of another book. Anyway, the qualifications for a bishop, and the first thing... That Paul says in both of them. Oh, to, let me, 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a true saying. If a man desire the offer of a bishop, he desireth a good thing. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife. Right out of the bat. Right out of the chute. In both places. Where Paul gives the qualifications for a bishop. A bishop is an old term. It means a pastor. Like a shepherd. The word pastor comes from the word pasture, where the sheep are. Bishop, pastor, same thing. The qualifications for a bishop is that he is to be the husband of one wife. You cannot be a husband. Well, you used to couldn't. You cannot be a husband if you're a woman. You cannot have a wife if you're a woman. Not in God's eyes you can't. So God does, does not allow a woman to be a bishop. Now, people will say, oh, yeah, but the, the, we're under grace and the Holy I had a guy. He wasn't even just but a new Christian. And he was going to an assembly of God church. And he read that. He read, let your women keep silence in the churches. And he read the woman was to be the uh Bishop, the husband of one wife, or the, or a man to, supposed to be the bishop, the husband of one wife, and he brought that to his pastor. He said, why is it that we have women preachers here all the time, and why is it that all these women are talking and prophesying and speaking in tongues? His pastor said, well, that wasn't written for us, that was written for those people back then, they had different ways back then, 2,000 years ago, but that's not us nowadays. And I'm going, where does it say that? Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. Just because man changes the rules doesn't mean that God has to fall along with them. And he says that for a reason. Out of about 40 people that wrote the Bible, all of them are men. Every single one of them. And it is simply because... She is the weaker vessel. Satan went to Eve first to give her the false doctrine. She fell for it rather easily. And so God has perpetually, God never, I mean, there were, there were no queens of Israel. 
There were no, the 12 apostles were all men. The bishops were all men. The elders were all men. Oh, you, have a, you have a few exceptions with the elders. You have the elder lady that John wrote to. You have a few prophetesses. Now, the Holy Ghost does allow. He said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Prophesy simply means to say what God said. Ezekiel, son of man, prophesy unto the people. Prophesy and say unto them. And then God would give him the words to say. And so, ladies, I would say outside of the church service, you are fully authorized and commissioned to bring up scripture all you want to in your daily conversations with people, whoever you want to give them Bible verses, give them scripture, tell people what God said. I don't have a problem with that in the world. Okay. Put them all over your Facebook page, share a verse a day. I got a lady that sends out text messages every day and she sends out big string of Bible verses every day to everybody that she knows. And uh, some people like it and some people don't. They don't want to read her Bible verses. But God bless her for that. Not a problem in the world for that. But clearly, because of the way God designed both men and women, the women are not allowed to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, 1 Timothy 2.12, but to be in silence. During the service. Now, y'all be glad we don't live 150 years ago. Mom, I, got, I don't know if you remember, I got a chance to go into the very first Free Will Baptist Church up in New Durham, New Hampshire. And the, the pews were all together. They didn't have a center aisle. But they had a divider right down the middle of that church. And all the women sat on one side. The women and the children sat on one side of the church. And all the men sat on the other side of the church. That's how they did it a couple hundred years ago. That's how they had their service. They divided the women from the men. And they kept that separate back in those days. Uh, so clearly Jezebel has called herself to preach and to teach and to usurp authority over the men of the church of Thyatira. And Jesus is going to put a stop to it. I've had it. I've had enough. And I'm going to give you space to repent. But then what it was she was teaching. And I've gone over this before, but I'm going to do it again very quickly. He said, uh, back in Revelation chapter 2, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Turn with me very quickly to the book of Acts, chapter 15. Acts 15. I have examined this text multiple times. I believe that there is a reason... Um, I would say a, a Bible prophecy reason why the Jerusalem Council came up with the four rules that it came up with concerning what the Gentiles should and should not do. The issue was, should um, the Gentiles keep the Old Testament laws, the feast days, circumcision, things like that, should they do those things in order to be saved or in order to stay saved, should they keep the law? Should they do all the observances that the Jews did? Of course, James, the Jews said, we didn't do it. Why should we make them do it? So they came up with, in verse 20 of Acts 15, four things that we write unto them that they abstain from the pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled, and from blood. And the very thing that Jezebel is teaching them is she's seducing them to commit fornication and then to eat things sacrificed unto idols. 
the very four things that the Jerusalem Council, the Holy Ghost, came in that church and, and moved in the hearts of all of those men, those elders, those bishops, those apostles, all those people who were in attendance there, they were all in agreement saying, this is what we should tell the Gentiles to do, these four things. Jezebel comes, lo and behold, and says, do these things. And they are a direct violation of what the Holy Ghost pronounced in Acts 15 and what the law prohibited all the way back in the Old Testament. You go all the way back into the book of Genesis chapter 9. God said, do not eat anything with the blood in them because the blood is the life thereof. Don't eat anything with blood. And here she's telling them to do that and eat things sacrificed unto idols. In other words, let me show you this. This comes from catholicnewsagency.com their website they wrote an article on why you should why you should eat the mass they said the mode of Christ's presence under the eucharist species in other words the wafer that the catholic church has in their monstrance they pull it out they hold it up they say uh hoc est corpus meum Hocus pocus. They say these magic words and now all of a sudden this piece of bread has turned into the literal body of Jesus Christ. That's what they believe. And you eat Jesus. And it says it raises the Eucharist above all sacraments as the perfection of the spiritual life and the end to which all the sacraments tend in the most blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, the whole Christ is truly, really, and substantially contained. This presence is called real, by which is not intended to exclude the other types of presence as if they could not be real too. But because it is presence in the fullest sense, that is to say, it is a substantial presence by which Christ, God, and man make himself holy and entirely present. They believe that that wafer now is Jesus. If you ask a Catholic, do you have Jesus in you? Yes. Last Sunday, I put him in me and I ate him. That's Jesus in them. And it's a lie. Worship of the Eucharist. In the liturgy of the Mass, we express our faith in the real presence of Christ under the species of bread and wine by, among other ways, genuflecting. You know what that is? You come into the Catholic Church, you bow, and cross yourself. Why, why are you doing that? You're bowing to an idol. Yes? One knee? I can't do that. If I did, you guys have to help me back up. I get you though. You're right. Genuflecting or bowing deeply as a sign of adoration of the Lord. You're not adoring the Lord. You're adoring a wafer. Something made with hands. The Catholic Church has always offered and still offers to the sacrament of the Eucharist the cult of adoration. Not only during the Mass but also outside of it, reserving the consecrated host with the utmost care, exposing them to the solemn veneration of the faithful and carrying them in procession. In other words, the seeds of the Roman Catholic Church can be seen all the way back in the church of Thyatira with Jezebel the prophetess. She's teaching a form of, of transubstantiation. She's teaching a form of the fact that the meat or the bread offered in front of an idol is the real and true way to salvation. And it's, a, it's an abomination in the eyes of God. The church has always understood a real presence. For example, St. Ignatius or Ignoramus, is that what it says? St. Ignoramus of Antioch. Who was eaten by the beast in Rome around 107 AD wrote, The Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ. St. Justin the Martyr wrote about 145 AD, We have been taught that the food is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. 
The Council of Trent, 1551, defined that Jesus is really present in the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity. In other words, that is God. That wafer, once the, once the priest says the magic words over it, it becomes their God. And you must worship it. And they say that we cannot, we, us, in this church, cannot go to heaven because we refuse to bow in front of their idol. Let us die as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were willing to die before we bow to any man's idol. Somebody say amen. Father, bless your word. Thank you for it. Teach us, Lord, the right way. Teach us the true way. And we thank you, Lord, for a book that guides our way in our thoughts. Show us how to worship you. Teach us to pray. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.